Give that mic here just to be tap. Okay. Oh. And just sort of keep it like a list away, yeah. Many podcasts have we done? 15? This will be... This one is like, ooh, 15, I think. I think. Come in here and shiver. Hey, come in here and he's shivering in here. Hopefully not. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a co- I'm, a, I'm a couple of parts of I don't have a lot of body fat. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes it's uh, the challenge you have to sit in here too long. No, that's bad. <laughs> David, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you. Thank you very much, Arthur. So, to anyone that's maybe not um, heard of you before, doesn't know you, you maybe give us a wee intro to yourself. Absolutely. Well, my name is David Drake, and I'm an athletic performance coach. Um, been coaching for about 12, 13 years, um, taking, taking it pretty seriously with, with my coaching journey. and. Um, Typically, my day to day kind of work is with Ulster Rugby uh, right now and do some other stuff, um, some studying on the side, uh, just finishing up PhD, uh, and kind of do some work around education, uh, work with master students, and that kind of thing, just keep myself really busy. Yeah, um, I didn't know you were actually so be finishing PhD. Yeah, just, just now, I was kind of in my last year, part time. Right. Um, and what's it? Uh yeah, it's, a, it's a sports science based thing, looking at kind of testing, profiling of athletes, uh, taking around the, the quality of reinforced development, which is really the most explosive muscle yeah. qualities that I was really interested in and tied into my day to day work of coaching. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to chatting about the speed stuff in a minute, but before we kind of get on that, like what's your, your coaching journey been? I know you're working with, with Ulster now, you're doing work with the different schools and stuff, but how did you actually get there in the first place? Yeah, <coughs> when I was playing, I used, I used to. I used to get the bus home and just be really inquisitive about how I could make myself better and I always had this kind of lens that I was looking through which was about making my athletic performance better, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's the kind of, that was my motivation, so I knew quite early that I wanted to get into coaching um, and I've done a lot of coaching of just sport and different sports, yeah. um, soccer, rugby, um, multi-sport, um, but I got into coaching, I applied for an internship at um, Sports Institute in Ireland kind of coaching multi-sport at elite level, mm-hmm. kind of academy athletes setting up some regional centres for those guys and that was my, that was my kind of kick start and, and, and did that as a kind of complementary pursuit with my studying, you know, yeah. alongside and just, uh, as I said, I, I, I just kept really busy with that, so that, that got me going and I started coaching in, in some schools, some rugby clubs, um, some football clubs and just moving from, from Sinai, kind of got, got a role there and then from that I moved into Austin Rugby. And has it, like when did you sort of decide that you wanted to get in the strength condition side of it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was probably about 12 years ago. It kind of all just coincided, you know, with yeah. studying. I started studying sports science and still quite open-minded to what what I might do. Yeah. I, I remain open-minded to what I might do in the future, but um, I guess it was the formality of the profession. I just thought strength and conditioning, you know, maybe 14 or 15 years ago, just looked at the outset as something that I wanted to kind of pursue and it was something that was going to grow. And like, hey, it's changed a, a whole pile over kind of 14 or 15 years as well, you know. Yeah, it's funny because obviously you now strength and conditioning is such a big part of the new every sport, but I don't think, um, I'm sure back then it wouldn't have been a big thing, even probably within an argument, something still probably would have been. Not as mainstream as it is now, but it, it, it's interesting that you were able to kind of see that it was it was going to grow. Yeah. Like. yeah, I just think it takes lots of different forms. You know, even even right now, you know, a, I'm a, I'm a, now an athletic performance coach. You know, yeah. essentially a strength and conditioning coach. But you know, my my role is very specific in certain areas. You know, I, I'm not skilled in certain areas of strength and conditioning, if you like. Yeah. So while strength and conditioning is quite a general, you know, um, coaching role. You know, there are specialisms within that and I think that's the exciting thing and that's how things grow over time. You know, so when I was good at coaching perhaps maybe twelve or thirteen years ago it has, has really changed and I, I broaden my, my skills up hopefully in in some other areas, you know. Yeah. I'm sure that's a big thing about coaching as well, is no one like having self awareness that you're 
you're good at certain areas and other areas you need to improve on, like, isn't it? Yeah, well, well, I think it's pretty easy because whenever I started out, I wasn't very good at coaching, you know, very much, you know, <laughs> so it's like, I've got a lot of things that I need to improve on, so, yeah. and, you know, uh, that awareness is, is absolutely, as you said, actually, the key, the key to, to improvement, so I need to take a pretty good look at myself and work out what I need to improve in, and to be honest, Let's take some time to do that because we can't we can't change your total coaching skill set overnight. It's going to take years and years yeah. of practice. And the same that if you're a carpenter or a mechanic, it's going to take years and years of practice. And that's what coaching is for me. Yeah. That's, that's been my journey. I think as well, like people think that coaching is just uh, he's just a sort of good coach. You know, any other job, you know, I can learn that. There, but I think for course, when it comes to coaching, people think that's just something and need that you have, but really like any job or any skill, you can improve a lot on it. I think once you get into it, you can see that where you start and where you finish is just completely different or, or where you're at in a year's thing. Like, yeah, I think that's the fun of it, you know. Yeah. If something's completely fixed, you know, it's going to get pretty boring. So the fun is to change, it's the changes we can make to ourselves, but more importantly, to those people that we serve, it's just clients, athletes, teams, and other coaches. Yeah. Like I know I've only been on a fraction of time you have, but from where I started to where I am now, like how your mind changes in those three sixties with different things, you think, oh, this is the way to do this here, but it changes so much. Since you started maybe, you know, in that time, what's been the biggest things that either you've changed your mind on or things you just thought you'd never change your mind on? Yeah. If anything comes to mind. Yeah, well, like I'm, I'm on a constant roundabout, um, to be quite honest, and, and that's, um, people that know me or work with me, athletes that I work with, coaches that I work with, will know that I am a learner. Yeah. So um, those that know me, as I say, will, will see change in me and, and those things are really around probably mindset mm -hmm. um, and openness and, and more so in how we engage and how we work with athletes. Um, it's the tone, it's the character, it's the it's the it's the how we coach that that yeah. I think really makes a difference. We're, we're all trying to get better. Every team, every club, every athlete is all trying to get better. So we all start on the same level. Most of us know what we need to get better at. So really, what how we make some difference is in how we deliver a program, or yeah. how we create an environment, or how we create connection with an athlete. Yeah. So that's where the magic really is. And I say that not from a position of I know lots about that, mm -hmm. but more so that that's what my pursuit is. Yeah. yeah. I suppose the thing is like you can have you can have the best program in the world, but if you don't have it well communicated or your players put on it or an environment where the players can go in it, it doesn't really matter, does it? Going with thoughts and it's yeah. just like being taking a walk and you know going off the path and getting lost. And yeah. It might be the best the better possible walking route but you've got lost. Yeah. And for me it's it's not even how well you can coach it or how good an environment you can create as a group of coaches or as a personal coach yourself, but it's how the athletes receive it, it's how the clients receive it, what do they learn from you, that yeah. is your measure, not how good am I, how good is David Drake in coaching, that doesn't matter, yeah. it's how do the athletes improve, or how do they value your input, that's what we've really got to measure ourselves on, you know, so yeah. for me it's about the process and focusing on that. So what's the steps like if you're if you're trying to do that there when you're working with teams? What maybe is there steps in the head or is there principles you follow to try and do that? I think there there are you know, there 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 are a number of things that I would kind of consider as um, very formative if I ever go about approaching it. And that's really for, firstly I just try and get to know yeah. what's going on in an environment, what's going on with that team, what they need, and really my job is to serve them. So. I think it's been really open to kind of listen and to learn when, when you're working with somebody. You know, take a client walks through the door right now. You know, I think my starting point is ask them. Yeah. You know, that, that's the starting point. Where we then go with trying to improve them, I think that can be very agile and fluid as we go. And yeah. that's where we need good general skills. We think about something just like speed and agility. We've got these principles that we're trying to teach. You know, they're very generalizable across different sports, but how that's going to look within a session, that can be very different. And that's where that kind of bit where we were talking at the start around kind of just coaching experience is super important. You know, it takes time to learn those, how athletes react to certain things, how yeah. to set up a session, how to, how to create flow, mm -hmm. how to drive motivation and intent. 
you know, haven't even talked about the lot of the content yet, yeah. you know, but they're all really important considerations, you know. Yeah, I suppose it's just it's time and it's practice and it's experience and learn how to do that there. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, like, but we're, we're all just need to be open to that, you know, that there are many components of coaching that we can improve. Yeah. It's not just in what we know. Uh, and, and that's what I've tried to do primarily through studying and studying outside of, of strength and conditioning. It, it's just it's just coaching. It doesn't really matter what your job job yeah. is, there's probably a coaching element to it. Mm-hmm. And you know, you could be a supervisor working at, you know in retail and then you'll be coaching the, the assistant, you know, staff that are the working yeah. for you. So coaching is quite a universal um, competency mm-hmm. and um, you know, I, I just think it's something we really need to focus on and that's how, how to be effective in coaching. Yeah, like I know there's within the past sort of couple of years you see a lot of people are focusing more on the coaching side of things but probably up until now it, it isn't focused on and I guess you within, within the look anyway, um, a good example is like someone will just write a program and just hand out the themes like right, there you go. But there's no coaching, or there's no delivery, or there's, no, there's nothing else. It's, I think sometimes people think all you need is the uh, the steps and then like, oh, this is how you get stronger, do this program, blah, blah, blah. But it's, there's a lot more to that, isn't there? Absolutely. You know, and and let's, not, absolutely, but let, let's not <coughs> downplay the importance of knowing what you're coaching, yeah. understanding the, the, the technical component of coaching competency, uh-huh. but that's, that's probably a third of it. You know, and then the next component of it is really Getting the athletes to buy in, that's mm-hmm. teaching connection to what we're trying to do. And then the last part of it is probably how you deliver, yeah. either yourself personally or in a team of coaches or in a, in a full network of coaches in a big organisation, you know. So for me, working in somewhere like Gulfstream Rugby uh, just now it is, it is a wonderful opportunity yeah. to work as part of a collaborative team mm-hmm. of coaches. And we're probably talking about physiotherapy, strength and conditioning performance analysis, yeah. the sports specific coaches themselves, that's just, our program is, is the collaboration of all of that together, you know, so uh, that, that's the kind of fun part about what I do. Though. I suppose what's brilliant as well is that whenever you're in that environment, because you're around so many people like that, and like many people, your coach will probably improve, and because everybody's watching everybody, you're always giving the best you can possibly give as well. Which I think is the big thing whenever you're around, just like when people are in that network, you can only improve as well, like, can't you? Like, there, there are lots of tremendous coaches uh, that I'm fortunate <coughs> to work with at Austin Rugby right now. It's, 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 a, it's a great environment for me to learn personally, yeah. and for me to grow, uh, and for us all to grow together. And, and that's probably the point, you know, the challenge and, and kind of working through in my head is how you work well together as a group mm-hmm. of coaches. And for, for us to kind of view the program as something that we're all part of mm-hmm. and, and not having separate components of programs that we're either happy or dishappy with, you know. So I don't see the, the gym as the strength and conditioning program, you know. I, I see the gym as an opportunity to yeah. grow the players, to stress the players, mm-hmm. and that everybody has their part to play in that. Um, and, and there are a number of things that we've got to do. Uh, you know, it, it's easy to sit here, you know, on a podcast and talk about mm-hmm. it. Um, but it, it, it's hard work in the ground, but it's rewarding work. And yeah, it's effective yeah. in terms of the environment we create and how the athlete receives that back at that point. You know, it's not about what we do as coaches, it's about how the athlete responds to what we do. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah. I, I think as well, you know, going back to the point where you're kind of reviewing that, that environment that you're in, I think that's one thing that probably coaches. A lot of people wouldn't be open to it, it's like having, having people watching your sessions and and they want to be reviewed, but it's it's only going to lead you to getting better. Like and I thought it was interesting so David, the context, David um, done a lecture during uh, our masters a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, was videoing and uh, sound recording it for his own kind of um, your own learning I suppose, your own review. But I thought that was interesting because you know so many times coaches will will want other coaches to watch and won't they stay away but it's obviously an important thing or important thing that you you see the, the yeah. improve as well. Uh, absolutely. Like I, I think the, the number one factor in me learning is me being open to learning. And yeah. like, so how, so let's let's now talk about how do I learn? Well I learn from doing mm-hmm. the same as everybody else. 
Um, but more importantly, I learned from being self-reflective or reflecting from my peers. So I can look at myself, that's the video, it's the audio, it's, mm -hmm. it's reviewing the session in my own head, taking those steps, and then it's asking others for input. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 the absolute strength of a group is the collective spirit of that, which is much, much greater. Anytime I collaborate, whether it be research, whether it be coaching, whether it be taking a session, that, that outcome is much, much better and much, much happier with outcome of that than I am when I work independently. And again, it's a challenge. You know, it's easy also for us to sit here and talk about yeah. it, but it is a challenge. Collaboration is a challenge, but it is the right challenge. It leads to something greater. And that's for me when I'm talking about how I learn and how I grow as a coach. It's about being open to my own personal and peer reflection. Yeah. And just being outward looking, you know, at, at all times. And um, sometimes just taking a step back, taking a bigger picture view on it really helps for me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really easy to get day to day kind of and kind of a little bit stuck, you know, a little bit stuck in the mode of just delivery, 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 but um, and let's be completely clear, it's super important that we are delivering, 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 that's keeping busy, that's getting your, you know, your hands dirty with coaching, but if we're not taking that step back, I don't think we're probably growing at the rate that we possibly could. And what I mean by stepping back is that, is that review process yeah. um, that, that I just kind of described. Yeah. So as regards to the work you did Ulster, you're in the strength mission uh, department there, but no, these are all very open and working. Like, what is a what does a day to day look like for you at Ulster? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> but a day to day, a day to day is like super busy. Um, you know, we start pretty early and, and, and get organised. Mm -hmm. um, we get organised together as a group of staff um, in advance of of the player yeah. coming in, and then when the players come in, you know, it, it's a it's a pretty busy day. There's there's not a lot of time for for air, but it's it's one that you leave and um, fit in tired but energized yeah. mentally that we've actually achieved something. It's a it's a growing space, and, you know, it's a it's a it's a challenging environment but it's 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 one that's really fast yeah. and good. And um, every day is a little different, you know, but everything works back like any sport off competition, off your game. Yes. So we're playing on a Friday or Saturday, every everything works back off that. Mm -hmm. We do our hard work at the start of the week and we sharpen everything up to, towards the end of the week. Yeah. Um, and, and that works, you know how does, a, how does the athletic performance program work on a day to day or a week to week basis? That depends on the rugby. Yeah. Um, it depends what we're trying to do on the field and everything gets tailored off that. And my job is to support the rugby program as yeah. an athletic performance coach um, and run a program that integrates uh, into that and supports that. Yeah. And so, well, usually the lads come in the morning and they'll do some sort of work in the gym and then go on the pitch. Yeah. Um, and then you're depending on the thing of the year or the thing of the week, your session is still towards that there then? Yeah, absolutely. So um, if we just take through one, one kind of main day as an example, players will come in and uh, when they arrive they'll do some screening and um, some kind of check-in process and that's integrated between physiotherapy, medicine, strength and conditioning and staff and then from there we'll do some movement health work which is more around um, injury prevention if you could use that kind of global yeah. term for what we're trying to achieve and that priming the body for movement that day and um, for taking on and conquering yeah. what we're going to what we're going to do uh, players will be fed on site so everybody's eating together uh, and then we're done in some work that day so um, on, on an main training day it might start with some review of, of, of games or, or players taking some personal responsibility to review that yeah um, we'll then have some some gym oriented work which really is just an athletic development program which involves rugby integration. So we could have our main training day, we might, we might start with a, a lower body power primer mm -hmm. into some power based training um, for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, which will be coupled up with some skill work. Then we might finish into like a strength block, um, right. which um, we've got our, some of our main exercises going on in there for strength development. And then we might finish on some robustness based work yeah. to gain it back into that kind of uh, reducing these kind of key areas that, that tend to get uh, exposed in rugby, shoulders, hips, hamstrings, calves, yeah. um, similar type of areas to, to move sports but we're focused on those at the end of the session. Um, then players might break for some meetings, 
focus in on, on the rugby uh, priorities for that day and, and then get on with on the field for some um, pretty robust and intense yeah. training. Um, and, and then at the end of the day we'll typically review kind of the quality, <coughs> the quality of everything that's taking place that day. Um, and yeah, so again constant review of right? constant review ahead, you know, ahead for, for the end of the next day. And see that I uh, think you said about a couple of the power work, couple of the skill work, is that like as in rugby skill work you should do a couple of work with? Absolutely. So absolutely. what would that look like? Yeah, so as I said, um, just to kind of at the start of the podcast, we, we view our gym as an opportunity just to develop athletic qualities and skill qualities. So we have a dedicated skills coach who works in that space alongside doing the program and just kind of mix everything together, brings the athletic performance into, into the rugby yeah. and the rugby into, into the athletic performance if you like it. And that's just one one big space of, of developmental yeah. Yeah, kind of work. And let's say for a, a gym session, just to give you a sense of that, um, we might be doing a, a small block of power based work mm-hmm. and let's, let's just say there's two or three exercises going on and, mm-hmm. and that might last for 10 minutes and those players may then break out as a group and do 10 minutes of skill based work mm-hmm. and that might be something that's worth focusing on for that week's game yeah. and that might be something that's just a long term developmental area and then they might come back into you know, lower body strength work or body strength work but that is that kind of interleaved program um, it doesn't isolate everything, it just combines everything together. Yeah. It uses the body as a whole rather than the baby yeah. look. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then a big part of your work is kind of that speed segment, would you say? Or? Absolutely. And before we kind of get into the, the, the principles and steps there, how did you kind of, like, is that something recently you focused a lot on, or has that always been a big focus here? Is that speed and acceleration? Yeah, I think the. The area as a whole, speed, agility, power development, it, you know, climatic kind of work to the training. For me, those have always been key areas, um, key areas for development, key opportunities um, for, for athletes to develop. And it's probably taken me some time to really work out how to best do that. Um, as an athlete myself, I was always working in that area, but I didn't fully understand probably what I was trying to achieve. Um, as a young coach, I was delivering in that area, but probably not as competent as I would like to have been at that point in time. Just sought out some deliberate kind of um, education in that space. And, and, and um, you know, looking hard into kind of acceleration, speed, and um, agility for team sports. Um, you know, I, I didn't find a lot. I didn't find yeah. a lot of kind of really move my knowledge on. Now don't get me wrong, there's good work being done. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just not as readily available as let's say, for example, strength training, yeah. which is kind of uh, very popularized, used across different sports. Yeah. But I think the area of speed, agility, power is, is probably underutilized in team sports. Um, yeah. You know, sure. just generalization, and, and that's, yeah. not, that's not being specific at, at anything in particular, but just that's my personal experience. You know, so let's go back to the, the question. Was I competent in coaching in these areas when I started coaching? Absolutely not. Yeah. It took me some time to really move my skill set on, mm-hmm. um, and I'm still trying to grow in that area. Um, how to be effective at coaching speed in team sport athletes, for example, that looks very different for me than sprint-based athletes. Agility in team sports athletes, that's almost a unique quality in itself and probably one that is more related to game performance than any other quality. Um, I think the importance of of these things um, perhaps could be be shown just a little brighter. Yeah, I think that's the thing. There's obviously so much information for track and field. It comes to sprint, but team-based stuff there is there's very very little. There's obviously more now, but yeah. I'm sure you know you're going through your journey. There was very very little that could be related to rugby or team sport. Yeah, absolutely, uh, you know my view on speed for team sports it isn't that kind of track model. Yeah, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about sprinting in team sports, I'm talking about game speed. I'm talking about high speed efforts. I'm yeah. Talking about I'm talking about events that happen on the field that demand the quality of speed. Mm-hmm. Like, let's look at what those might be in any sport. Counter-attack, 
cut through the to high speed change of direction. Yeah. Fundamental beating of another player. You know, when we really narrow it down. And what does that look like? You know, that, that comes down to really efficient change of direction mechanics. Mm-hmm. So for me, um, you know, game speed is probably is probably a term that I identify with. Yeah. And, and probably explore how to really how to really improve these areas. And I mean when we think about it, what we're trying to do is make people more efficient at moving around the field. That, yeah. That's probably the, the kind of fundamental yeah. area we're trying to improve. And then when, when so that's relevant to everybody in every position. And then we can probably add some icing to that kid and talk about highly effective movement performance that makes a difference. It's that beating a man. Yeah. You know, it's that change direction that creates mm-hmm. space. It's that defense of a counter-attack for the other team. I encounter the fence or something like that, but you know, yeah. it closes down. So the micro moments of milliseconds of time, but multiple, multiplied up, are probably the difference between yeah. making a tackle or you know, yeah. scoring or yeah. creating yeah. a goal. Perhaps or winning a reason, you know, but, yeah. but as I say, back to that kind of efficiency of movement, you know, we can make you move more efficiently, it costs you that energy. So that, that same journey you take yes. in the car is just cost you making mm-hmm. tackle. Mm-hmm. So for me, that's how I kind of begin to break it down. Yeah. Uh, so then, how do we go about moving better? What's the steps or is there principles there to do that? Okay, well, I, I think that's <coughs> uncomfortable with this one. How do we go about moving better? I think we need to be really deliberate mm-hmm. with probably two things. One, how we coach. So we need to be deliberate with what we're trying to achieve. We yeah. need to understand what we're trying to achieve. And that takes some time. And then the second thing is, Trying to drive that intent and the consistency of this work. Yeah. So, bringing David Drake in to coach one session is not going to make a massive difference to you. It is. It's going to drive some knowledge, it's going to bring some intent, it's going to be fun and enjoyable, mm-hmm. but really, we need to be consistent with this. Yeah. And just the work. Moving better, moving in a highly efficient manner, mm-hmm. is a long term pursuit. And it's that consistency I think that brings change, uh, longitudinal change, real change, change that lasts beyond one session. So for me that that measure of learning is whether that player is now automatic and how they move. So they move from a, from a gear system to an automated car, mm-hmm. you know, and they're moving more efficiently. And that's the test, that's the measure for me. Yeah, I suppose that's the big thing because I know people will you know, you can, you can probably go on YouTube, you can go anywhere and see the best drills in the world and all the best information, but it, it's really, you have to constantly be doing it, like, don't you, if you're not Absolutely. And doing it in the right way, with the right intent as you're talking about. I, I think in the right context of the sport, yeah. Yeah. you know, all sports have nuances, uh-huh. but these principles are quite generalizable, but we have to have the view of context. So we're, we're, our job is not to make people sprint in straight lines necessarily. Yes. It, it, it's, it, it's that non-linear movement that probably is the key. Um, and then every, every, every game there'll be one or two players that have that, the field opens up for them and they, and they can take that space and that's the difference between whether they do or not, they just feed into that. And, and, and for me, acceleration and sprinting are really important qualities. Perfect. Even more so than their specificity to game performance, as as modes of training, yeah. they're highly potent. Okay, so they take a lot of energy. They're they're very explosive type training drills, and they they take a lot of recovery from. As in, when we do some explosive based training, you know, it it, you, it takes a day or two to recover from that. Yeah. And so as modes of training, we can do them in big groups. We um, they're, they're not complicated to coach necessarily, although there's nuance within that, but I mean, you know, we can scale this up to your teams, we can, yeah. we, can, we can work in these things on a regular basis, and they require very little equipment. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about working on acceleration, working yeah. on speed, working on agility, working on plyometrics, you know. Um, Sprints, even though, like, it's a lot of research in terms of, like, call it like a sprint vaccine, for injury prevention, a very important thing to do as well, which, it's probably counter to what a lot of people think, no, don't, don't be doing anything like big heavy sprints when you because it causes injury, but in fact, done in the right way with enough of the right dosage can actually affect the foot prevent injuries. 
Yeah, well, well, that just keeps keeps on the point of consistency of yeah. exposure. I think that's the important point that we made here when we're training and equality. Doesn't matter what the quality is, let's not talk about speed right now, let's talk about any quality. We want to be consistent with it yeah. for it to move forward. Okay, now let's get back to speed. Clearly it's been shown that when we have regular exposure to high speed efforts, mm -hmm. we are more prepared for those high speed efforts when they come. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound too complicated, but when you think about it, there's just perfect logic. You know, if, if we want to be good at skill, we want to practice skill. If we want to be good at tapping, we got to practice tapping. Uh, if we want to be ready for these high high speed efforts within games, we've got to practice that. Yeah. And that's for me what robustness really is. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about robustness under that lens of, you know, not causing injury or, or, or being being resilient to injury, yes. you know, when these things happen. Now, Whilst that's been shown really clearly now with all of the all of the research coming out over probably the last two or three years with regards to speed, my hunch is that the same thing happens with acceleration and the same thing happens with agility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Whilst the evidence isn't there for that, yes. equally as important. Let's think about somebody getting injured when they're changing direction. That happens pretty regularly. Now this is not this change of direction vaccine that everybody's talking about. Yes. Um, but it, it, it's something that I think is super important that we, we consider moving efficiently in non-linear planes of movement. So changing direction efficiently probably has a knock-on effect on your risk of injury. Yeah. Probably, I'm saying, this is not a definitive, but it, it, again, it, it plays the common sense theme here. You know, if we need to be able to change direction faster than before, why aren't we working on that yeah. in a consistent fashion, mm -hmm. in a coach-led fashion? Yeah, that really helps that athlete perform their job in the game. Yeah, I think that makes that makes sense. But unfortunately, I think I think I know, I know within a lot of within GA, I think it's probably I think people are getting more knowledgeable about that side of things. But again, it, it's not practice probably because there's just a lack of knowledge around it. But um, it makes total sense. You know, whenever you're getting injured in one of those sprints or in that change directions, probably you know, like your body's not used to. It. Doesn't know what's happened, and you move inefficiently because of that, and that's what happens. But if you've constantly, yeah. constantly done it, yeah. and, and, and this isn't a criticism of, yeah. of coaching or, 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 or coaching knowledge, this is a challenge. You know, I, I was that coach that was taking sessions, and I didn't fully understand what I was trying to get out of that process. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of you know, embarking on this model of learning. Uh, of developing ourselves as coaches is really important because of the knock-on effect it has with these groups of players, with these athletes we're working with. So when we're talking about the potential for changing direction and sprinting to reduce the risk of injury, you know, we got to go and learn something in that yeah. space. So like, seek out experts in the field, mm -hmm. read, write, learn, talk, discuss, chat to people that know something in that space, look up the athletes yourselves, and just, just explore it is what I'm kind of getting yeah. at. I think that's the first step. In fact, if you try and improve myself as a coach, you know, video yourself and watch it. Yeah. You know, if I'm trying to learn in the agility space, I'm going to talk to people who know something about that. So that's, that's very much something that's helped me, uh, experts in the field, you know, from across the world, and just chatting to them, hanging out with them, and really trying to learn. And just whatever that means for you in your, in your coaching environment, you know, um, I'm certainly reachable. Uh, there's lots of good people doing this, this work in this space. And um, I, I don't know, that's just, it's just really important for us to kind of consider. The great thing is now, probably very different to whenever you start. There is so much information out there and there's people having conversations like this and a hundred other podcasts and videos, yeah. so there, there is so much information yeah. out there. It's just, you know, the one thing I find whenever you, whenever you start to look into the speed, thing, the speed side of things, you go down this rabbit hole and you realise you know absolutely nothing about it. Like, you think you have an idea and then you go in and there's so much there, but it, it's amazing too whenever you see that. Yeah. I, I think we just need to be open minded to that. Yeah. You know, none of us have the answers. You know, I, I, certainly, I certainly don't. And, and, and the rabbit holes exist in every field, in every sport. And it's the pursuit of actually going there that helps you learn. Uh, and, and that's something that I just I have, have loads of reward from. You know, and just kind of spending time in groups in an area. Yeah. And, or bringing people in, collaborating with people that are doing something in that space to really help me learn. It's back to that point of, of the power of the group. You know, 
if, if we're pursuing these things together, talking about them together. Um, and I think the key thing for us when we're learning and when we're thinking about these things, let's talk about speed and agility. It's for, for the reader or for the listener to decide what works for them. Yes. Um, th there is no magic bullet. It just takes the principles and consistency and context for it to really work. Um, so you be the judge. You know, yeah. you decide whether it works for you for your group, for that sport at any point in time. You know, you don't let anybody else decide that. That's your journey. Um, so I, I'm really open to that. You know, any content that I put out, people being really, really critical of that whenever they use it, take it away, yeah. have a go, come back to me, tell me if it works for you or doesn't work for you, and why not? Because it's that why okay. that we really learn. Yeah. I know this is like a very uh, general qu question, and I think I know it depends a lot on the context. But if I'm a player and I'm looking down to pitch today, yeah. what's a couple of things? Like I've done the equipment with me. Yeah. What's a couple of things I can do to improve that acceleration or that sprint? Yeah. Or uh, drills or, or yeah. what would you recommend? Okay, so look at acceleration for me is a powerful activity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So acceleration you can kind of you can kind of consider it more like jumping. Yeah. Sprinting is more of a skillful activity and it's more like bouncing on a trampoline up and down. Yeah. Okay, so acceleration is more about pushing. And so what we want to think about is the intent at which we push. So with every single step option, when you go down the pitch today, I want you to push as far as you can when you're accelerating. Yeah. When we're sprinting, let's think about rhythm and fluency. One question you could ask yourself whenever you, whenever you hit that top speed is could you hold it? And it's that rhythm that you want to work on. Okay, it's that fluency. Okay, it's the scale of sprinting. So those are two really simple things, just as a just to help with understanding and thought, whilst they're not drills, they're, they're, they're key considerations. Now here, here's the thing, there are a million different drills that we can do. It's why you do them, do you understand them, and it is the coaching effective within them. So let's think about accelerating. To improve your acceleration, it's probably worth doing some maximal acceleration type work. So what I'm saying is here, the attempt in which you do the drills, is super important, yeah. not just the drill themselves. Okay, we can break it down in, in, in coach space settings where we're working on specific drills to improve something. But fundamentally, if we want to change direction fast, you need to practice change direction fast. When we're going to accelerate, we're going to push as hard as we can, when we're going to sprint, we need to be running reasonably quick yeah. for us to get some benefits to that. Um, but like anything, you know, if you're going to practice your, you know, your kicking or your, or your pass or your, or your tackling or your, let's say you're going to practice some of the work you do in the gym, mm -hmm. you, you know, these are all skills. Acceleration is a skill and it's yeah. kind of different to sprinting. You know, change of direction, there, there are probably four or five different kind of key components of change direction and each of them are probably important, you know, each of them are skills. So, I guess what I'm saying, take, it, take this away, these, these components are skills and need practice. So let's practice regularly, yeah. let's expose ourselves to them regularly to get the benefits from them. Yeah, I think one of the things maybe you're, you're taking the lecture the practical side of it, um, was everything that you were describing in the acceleration drill, you were big on pushing that, you have to have the intent as in like, you have to be driving yourself into the ground and propelling yourself as far far as possible. But I think oftentimes, and say for example, if you were doing like a, a bound, you maybe sometimes you don't think about that, but whenever you're doing those drills, whether it be that bound or that broad jump, whatever it is, you, you have to be doing with the max intent possible. Like that's so important, isn't it? Yeah. The speed and agility as it has kind of modes of training are the greatest muscular, tendon, and neural load you can experience as an athlete. You know, so it's the greatest demand. Running fast is harder mm -hmm. than running slow, to paint a simple picture. So the faster you're moving, the faster you're changing direction, the greater the load involved in that, and therefore the greater the demand. So yeah. these little areas um, require intent to develop them. Yeah. Um, we're not going to develop these qualities working so maximally. Um, in the same way that when we are working maximally, that takes some recovery. And I'm not talking about within a session, but more day-to-day, -day, kind of week-to-week basis. So typically for 
for anybody wanting to improve their speed or agility today, you know, I, I would be saying work on it a couple of times a week mm -hmm. and be consistent with it. And we could, we could break down an acceleration day, a sprint day, or we could do an acceleration and agility day, agility day and then a sprint day. And sometimes we break agility day into two components within, within Ulster right now. This is, this is perhaps a little insight into that. We'll consider agility from two perspectives, attack and defense. Mm -hmm. So when you're on the ball, <coughs> and we're working in possession of the ball, we're talking about attacking agility, mm -hmm. which is more around cutting, evasion, and movement in the space. When we're talking about defensive actions, we're probably talking more so around deceleration, yeah. tracking an opponent, and defending in that kind of tackle space, or, or trying, trying to close somebody down, if that kind of summarizes yeah. across different sports. So the, what, what I'm saying is, let's work consistently. If, you, if you're out there and on the field, you know, it's a couple of times a week, it's taking the time to build up to doing some intentful work. And we've got, it's that, it's that sort of intent or that drive that really yeah. helps us to learn how to move at a higher speed. Yeah, I, th I think it's important, I think it's good that you say that because maybe a lot of times we'll get bogged down in, you know, what's the best drill or what's the best exercise, but sometimes it's, you know, how well are you actually doing and what's your intent like. So yeah. I'm sure the takeaway te kind of is like, Whatever drill you decide to do, make sure you do with the same intent you do in the game or in the session. Absolutely, and it's not a it's not a war against drills. Yeah. Drills are a wonderful way of priming the brain for that higher level movement, you know, for that more complex movement. So I, I'll build a session from priming movements, you know, essentially warm, warming that movement up, warming the brain up for that movement. Then I'll build the intent, just like climbing a set of stairs. You know, I've got half at the set of stairs right now and we're building the intent of that drill. Yeah. I might be doing that through some partner work, I might be doing some use of using the bands, mm -hmm. I might bring in the ball, and then I'm gonna take that final couple of steps and really up to kind of sport specific work, the context. Yeah. What does this movement mean for your sport? That might be evading a player, driving into the space either side of that player. Okay, now we're having context to that. There might be a ball, there might be a certain scenario on the field that we're using. Uh, and, and that's how I'll typically try to build a session out, right from, from the bottom step yeah. to the top step. Every single session, it needs context, it needs intent. You have to check those two boxes, you're, you're going the right direction, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Look, if, if I'm going to work on something, I need to know what it is. Yeah. You know, as a player, I'm talking about right now, so my, my, if I'm walking out into the field, I need, I need to know there's a why behind this. Yeah. And just the same. That anchors me into the rationale. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I don't need to explain to the players the, the science behind what we're trying to work on. They just need to contact. Yeah. They need contact. And with that, over time, because we are consistent about what we're working on, we gain trust. Yeah. We, we build, build that buy into what we're working on. And with that, you get increased motivation. Yeah. So people wanting to do this work, mm -hmm. not coaches wanting players to do this work. And that's that's the difference. Yeah. yeah. For me that's back to the high of the program. It doesn't you know, it doesn't matter what drills I know, it's it's how we're delivering that and I'm just giving you a little insight through that kind of um, that series of, of yeah. steps there um, to, to kind of do that within the session. Yeah. I think that's definitely um, I think that's important just just reiterating that do it with the right intent. If you do that there, no matter what you do, you probably well, that's you're, you're in a better place than yeah. you were before that. Yeah, if you just if you put your mind in anything, you know, that's, that's kind of it's about focus of like focus of your energy really or, or deliberateness of your work, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I think we do so well, absolutely. You see if if I'm a coach and I'm working with a team and we have twenty or thirty players in front of me, um, and we are working on just say max accelerations, ten yeah. meters, twenty meters. If I'm looking and I can see, okay, this half there, the pass or the curve, this half is good, do you, do you go, do you know what, I'm not going to do these max accelerations because half the group is not moving efficiently or do you just say that's the way to move and do you just continue with it or, you know, what, what would be your steps there, okay, right, sir? That's, that's a really, really nice example uh, and a nice challenge for me to have. So what I'm going to do is 
these, if these, this group of players is healthy mm -hmm. and they're performing within their sport, will they are max accelerated or better? Yeah. Okay, so I don't have a concern there. It's about how I add value as a coach. So what I'm going to do in session one is I'm going to get them to do some work. I'm going to stand back and I'm going to learn from them. So there's two things I'm going to do. I'm going to ask them some questions mm -hmm. and I'm going to watch their movement with the intent with my coaching eye as they're showing through their movement. So their intentful movement is the same as my intentful coaching. Yeah. And I'm going to learn from that session what people need to work towards. And I'm going to try and help that, not in a direct way, but a more invisible way. So I'm going, to set, I'm going to set up some ways for them to try and get better, you know, some appropriate drills. Now, we've probably got two or three different types of drills around acceleration that we might work on, but the mm -hmm. principles are universal. Yeah. So when we're talking about working with maybe 30 or 40 people all at once, it's how I manage that session that allows me that opportunity to coach people that makes a difference for me. Yeah. So I wanna I wanna keep my sessions super simple, really enjoyable, high energy, people doing lots of work, mm -hmm. but in a way that I can actually coach. So I can't have 40 people working all at once. I wanna break that, that session up into small groups or themes of work that allow me the opportunity to coach. The other thing that I'm gonna do within this session is I'm gonna video that mm -hmm. and I'm gonna reflect on how those players have moved and how they've moved in response to me as a coach. Yeah. So if I'm taking your team today, Oshin, I wanna video it and then I'm gonna take the opportunity to feed back after that session, either to the other coaches, to one or two players, but that's where we're probably making some, some real yeah. change or, or some opportunity to make change over time and say we're, we're not going to fix everything up in one yeah. session. You know, we'd be naive to, to, to even consider that type of thing. We want to ensure that one, people enjoy the work that they're doing, they enjoy the session, yeah. and two, that we give them some understanding and teach them a little bit about the why. I think with that, we're anchoring into your brain knowledge that you can take forward as an athlete. Yeah. And it's back to that, it's back to that point around let the athlete tell us what they know, let them show us what they know mm -hmm. in their movement. Let's question them to really consider what sort of questions would you be asking them, you know, you're saying there? Yeah. What would you be sort of asking type of play yeah. um, Okay, so when I'm watching their movement, I'm getting a, I'm getting an insight to their brain and what they think. Mm -hmm. So I'm directing my questions based on how they're moving. Um, quite often if I if I'm cueing something or I'm exploring some new type of drill, mm -hmm. I might ask them how that feels for them. Yeah. And then I might add some some coaching to that. And then I'm and then what I'm gonna do is follow up. So I'm gonna say, Oshin, I want you to drive a little bit further with every step than you did in the last set. And once you take that rep, you're gonna walk all the way back to me and then I'm gonna ask you, did that help you? Mm -hmm. Okay, and when I add that cognitive load of, of actually coaching them, that has the potential for two things, making them better or making them worse. And that's for me when I got to stand back and really have a look at that. Yeah. Because not all coaching has a positive effect all the time. And, and, and that's where that kind of follow-up, that use of video, that me being self effect is really important. Um, I can say the same thing to two different players and they'll take it two yeah. different ways. That opportunity to actually follow up. For me to question you, I'm checking if you're understanding what I'm saying. Yeah, that's probably a key, is a key thing. Yeah, I think the important is, is the question afterwards, after you've given the first bit of advice, and did that help? Which probably not a lot of people will do either, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, not everything is so black and white and that this will make a player do sprint faster or perform better, you know, because everybody does take things differently. And I know even within, within our team, if a coach says something to me, I might take it bad, but I know if he said it to somebody else. They would be motivated, motivated by it. You know, I, I think that's, I think that's important. Um, so I, I guess kind of what you're saying is, you would allow the, you would let those accelerations happen, but then you would maybe try and sort of put in the drills without the people realizing that you're trying to work on specific things, and then you're constantly questioning and say, did this help you? Did it not help you? Absolutely. That's yeah. There's, there's, there's no magic trick coming, you know, we're, we're going to explore a drill that promotes a movement. Let's say we're going to add a band to a resistant acceleration mm -hmm. to try and teach them how to drive against that resistance. Then we're going to take that band away and check that that's had a positive effect. You know, that's scalable with 40 players or all, all within, you know, let's say four groups of 10 working. It gives me an opportunity to stand back and coach. Uh, and what I might do is just pick out 
hey, Oshin, you know, that's, that was a great, that's a great set right there, and this is what you did really well. And, and me just coaching that one player within that group of 10 affects the other nine within yes. that group. So it's that, it's that kind of positive kind of ripple effect of coaching. Mm -hmm. And the key thing is that I set up the session in a way that's simple, that the players understand it, and that it gives me an opportunity to have an impact, to, ha to have those comments, those cues, those questions. Uh, and what that does is that allows me to coach a full group. Because with, without that, then what I'm seeing is 40 guys moving at one time, or girls moving at one time, mm -hmm. and that's pretty difficult to intervene. Yeah. Now, just to give you an insight into my, my world of coaching right now at Austin Rugby, we, we coach in a collaborative way, so we'll have four coaches in a particular speed or agility session as a minimum, coaching in the region of 40 players. So yes. I'll never be isolated within a gym environment. We will have a minimum of four or five mm -hmm. coaches across senior and academy programs. We'll have at least one rugby coach, if not two to three. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll have a physio or two or three on a given day, depending on the flow of the day. So really what we're talking about here is a team of coaches. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, you know, within that environment, it's, it's all of our responsibility to, to make sure we connect with the, all of the components of the program and make sure everybody knows what's going on. Yeah. And that's a great challenge to have as a team of coaches. So when you're in your local club or your local team, let's see if we can, we can connect other coaches into what we're doing and have that power of the effect. So yeah. every single player within that session gets something to take away to take forward or, or, ha or has that positive impact from that session. So sprinkle your coaching magic across that session with all of your coaches if you can. I know that's a challenge for everybody, yeah. but it's something worth exploring, scaling up the coaching impact that we can have. Yeah. You know, so we're not having coaches with hands and pockets um, watching another coach coach. You know, yeah. just, just something to, to perhaps yeah. think about for, for people. I think that it's definitely an interesting thing because I know probably there's a lot of, in a lot of teams that, that will happen where one coach will take the, the responsibility of it, but I suppose that's if you're looking to be the best thing possible, you have to do things that you normally do and that requires people to do things like that, but um, it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. Well, let me paint this picture. I'm a coach and I'm taking a gym session with, let's say, 25 players. And I go over to coach player A in one corner of the gym. Mm -hmm. That means there's 24 other players not getting coached at that particular point in time. Yeah. Now you, you scale that two minutes of time, let's say you've been really efficient over that session, two minutes of time coaching that one player. Okay. Now yeah. you go and coach another player, that's another two minutes. So there's another 23 players yeah. that still haven't been coached. So we really need to think about how we scale our coaching impact. And we do that by being collaborative in how we coach. So we're yeah. bringing coaches together to coach a program. You can still be a lead coach for that session. Let's say it's a warm up on the pitch. There might be a lead coach, but we want to kind of satellite out our coaching into different parts of the session, you know, in different yeah. parts of the field or in different groups within a session. Yeah. Okay, I know um, up at Derry, so I've been working with the, the minors and the champions. And there's a great group of coaches there that have been involved and have watched the, the gym programs over the past number of years, so having a good idea of how people should move. So it's great where like, I can go and tell everybody the session and maybe we can say, all right, we're, we're really focusing on the safe today. And they know what the movement should look like. So I can move down and talk to him in the bottom corner and one of the other coaches making sure it's going good here. And it, it makes the session feel so much better and you're not having to like run from here to here. You know, just it, it all works so nice when you have that. That sounds that sounds really good. Right, like it. What what I like about that is if I if I'm that player in that session, what I'm getting is not just the session, but I'm getting quality. Yeah. You know, getting your quality time rather than obviously it's running around, yeah. you know, like like a bee trapped in a jar, which we all can be as coaches at times. So you know, that, you know that gets the quality of impact you want to have. That gets the sound so good. And it's, it's a real privilege for, for for us all to be involved in an environment like that. Yeah. So I'm sure the players are feeling that as well when they're, when they're receiving that. I think so. Well, I think it, it, it's good too whenever the actual football coaches understand what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. And you know, like up there, we there's great buy-in from them, and that's not like like. It's it's got on the edge here. I mean, they're they're fully not taking much change. You need to do it, and that, that I just think it's a it's a good environment to be in. But 
every club, every player can pick a wee piece of that there and probably take it into their own environment. Here, here's what I think about that. So if you've got your, your, your football coaches connected with the Y, what you've got is, is a strength and conditioning program for the club. Mm-hmm as opposed to a strength and conditioning program that runs separate from the club. Yeah. So your program actually is aligned in the values if you want your club mm-hmm. and, and, and coaches within that club and not siloed out. I think that's really important. I, I don't think it's a real program until, until yeah. you really consider those things. You know, what we have is, you know, David Drake coming in and running a strength and conditioning session. No, it's not it's not David Drake's strength and conditioning session. Yeah. It's a strength and conditioning session for that club. Yeah. So that's what's important is what does the what does the club want? You know, what does that team want? What does the environment need? What do the players need? So those are all you know things we've already really talked about right at the start, but just to reiterate how important I think these things are. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Going from the pitch into the gym, um, if you're looking at, you know, I'm looking to get more powerful, I'm looking to get faster, can I do it in the gym? Absolutely. And what are what's the steps or what's the principles to do that? Yeah. I think the gym is an opportunity to again consider the movements that we're trying to improve on the field and then break things down. So we can be strengthening in those specific areas or we can be working on the efficiency of those movements. So for me, simple things like plyometrics, like um, early acceleration type work, so three, four steps only, and um, you use bands, boxes, explosive kind of work, step ups. Uh, we, we do lots of different, yeah. lots of different varieties. I think, I think the important thing is to consider here, what are you trying to change in the field? And then have a component of that layered into your gym based program. The gym is a space for developing athletic movements. So that will that maybe start with us and from a mobility perspective, then priming in the power based work and then the strength based work for us within our, our typical uh, structure. But I just view it as an opportunity to be consistent with the movements we're trying to change. So for us, those really fundamentally we could just we could just summarize them as being jumping, mm-hmm. cutting, and sprinting. Yeah. You know, and sprinting really in team sports we're talking about acceleration yeah. type principles. Um, so it's those layers of movements that we're trying to be consistent with in the gym every time we walk in there. Yeah. Every time. So we're not going to improve this efficiency in athletic movement unless we're consistent with it. And we can't be consistent with it if we only do one type of work in the gym environment. So the gym for me is just another space you know, to improve. It's another piece of paper to do your painting of all. You yeah. know, so for, for me, it's about thinking about what this team is trying to achieve. Again, aligning maybe the values of the team to, to mm-hmm. that. You know, we might, be, we might be training discipline and everything we're going to do today is yeah. with real control. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we might be on a power phase where everything we do today is with real intent. You know, on a speed phase where everything's more coordinated, more skillful, and we might be tying in, for example, in a speed phase with, with, with some of the rugby guys, we, we might be tying in some key skills and executing those yes. types of movements in a really fast, unloaded type environment. So, you know, it, again, what I'm painting here is this broad picture of working on these different modes that are super important for field sports performance in the gym environment. I, I hope that some yeah, of that I think so. I think so. Um, just when you were talking about Singing you were chatting about like sprinting and acceleration being a skill. We're in the main gym now, so we've 10 meters of, of the grass here. You know, in each of my gym sessions, should I be trying to incorporate some sort of acceleration or sprint and drill, or should it be as simple as that in the world? We're doing some 8 meter, 10 meter accelerations. Absolutely. Well, if, if your gym space allows for that, that, that that's awesome. Uh, if you're not doing it on the field, which I'm advocating that we should be, mm-hmm. uh, then we, we should be kind of touching yeah. on some of that or, or having that as a key component within the gym program as well. So let's take the gym space right here, it's 10 minutes long. I'm sitting on the, on, 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 on the grass turf right now. I would perhaps be using the resistance gear that we've got for the strengthening component. I'd be using the walls, the pitch positions, yeah. and I'd be using the, 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 the grass turf area to be working on that acceleration. Even yeah. if that's just a simple, as the first two or three steps in an acceleration. It might be the, the cutting action 
and, and a change of direction component, but all of these, all of these um, aspects of athletic movement can be done in a two or three meter space at the edge of a rack. So um, let's not use that um, that kind of restriction as uh, an opportunity to make an excuse. You know, it doesn't matter what equipment we have, but you know, if we understand what we're trying to change uh, in terms of jumping, changing direction and accelerating, then I think we have the opportunity to put it into any program, anywhere, at any time, whether we're traveling, getting off a bus, and, 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 and taking 15 minutes in the car park, you know, yeah. they might be on, a, you know, at, at the end of a training day, the start of training day, you know, for, for, for me, I think there's, there's always an opportunity to get in this work that we think is important. So the question really that I have is, do you think this work is important enough? Because yeah. that, that's, that's for us to decide. You know, choose what we think is important, prioritize that, and make it part of the program. Yeah, I think it's definitely, um, it's interesting. That it's something like I've been trying to integrate into the sessions with the ones that come down here is like, how can I, how can I integrate the acceleration or the, or the mechanics? You know, and you're always learning, trying to figure out different ways, but I'm sure you can, like you said, as simple as doing maybe a few plyometrics, yeah. doing the wall drills, or, or even just working on the first one or two strides yeah. is done enough and consistently with the right intent can probably lead to a lot of good results. Absolutely. Absolutely. With regards to the bench, or the bench, with regards to the gym, yeah. do you have any benchmarks that like, you would aim for or that you say this is optimal for um, being the best shape physically? Yeah. yeah. So I think there's there's <coughs> um, some simple simple things I can share on top on this. It's what are we trying to change? And let's measure that. Mm -hmm. And we look at the full athletic profile of a player. So and we're, we're not just looking at one component and we're trying to balance all of those things up and decide what we then want to change and whether that change is worthwhile to be yeah. sure. So and um, we're looking at all the different components. Let, let's just talk about a few of them. Acceleration ability, jumping ability, change of direction ability, strength, and then we've got different components of strength. Then you got fitness, and then you got all of the rugby components, and um, or all of the skill components within your sport. So for us, it's about collaborating as a group to really decide what this what this athlete needs, what this client needs, whatever, whatever the case may be. Then we're going to put a program in place that allows for that player to develop, to you know, really target those areas. And yeah. um, some of the standards that that we would perhaps look at. And would be based across the entire um, population that we have in Ireland, you know, so we know kind of what uh, an international player might be able to output, yeah. uh, and, and, and therefore we're using those as our guiding light towards what we're, what we're trying to um, get everybody towards. Uh, but there's no perfect athlete, yeah. and it's probably more so about understanding what makes them tick, what makes them good. And as much strengthening those areas of weakness, we probably want to strengthen the strengths, make them superpowers as well. Yeah. Um, but let, let's, let's be honest, you know, athletic qualities aren't that complicated. You know, the, 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 key, the key ones for me are <coughs> moving fast, moving efficiently, and repeating that movement. Yeah. So in, in summarizing those, it's good movement, done fast, with good fitness, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's it in, in any sport, so um, the capacity to do that work is just as important as the ability to do it once, and, and for team sports and court sports and all these racket sports, you know, all of these competitions and games have an element of fatigue within them, mm -hmm. so that's where I think the movement efficiency and that robustness component comes in, being able to repeat movements is super important yeah. and, and that comes into then how we practice some of those and when we come you know when we come to kind of talk about our speed and agility program you know I talk a little bit about attacking and defensive agility and um, we're talking about acceleration we can we can throw one net around those and talk about the repeat ability of those as well mm -hmm. and that probably forms an, an element of your conditioning program for me yeah and, you know and, and repeating these high intensity efforts yeah yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, I suppose that's the big thing too, is it's great being able to perform those movements well, but if you don't have the uh, conditioning to do it in the last 10, 15, 20 minutes, it's not pointless, but it's, you know, it, it, 
doesn't maximise as much as it can do. So obviously there's, there's two sides to the coin all the time. Yeah, and I think more, even more so than within a game, like a, a, a you know a hard period of the game <clears throat> has a fatiguing element. That might be in the last the last period. It might be actually early in the game, whether it's a real intense period, yeah. and you know being able to repeat efficient movement and recover from efficient movement, you know, uh, recover from higher intensity efforts. And then, and then being able to do that on, you know, two days after the game and the next the game the next week and three months later and, and at the end of that year and then the end of five years, you know, it, it, it just all becomes um, one pursuit of being really effective as an athlete, you know, yeah. and that really requires some deliberate work, you know, mm-hmm. focusing on what is the priority, keep the main thing, the main thing, yeah. like, let's, let's, let's get good at the stuff we need to get good at, uh, and that's probably my, my mindset on it, you know, yeah. Yeah. There, there are lots of things we could be working on, there are lots of things that are fun, that are exciting, that are enjoyable, yeah. but we probably, we probably uh, lose some of the importance when we, when we try all these different, different methods and new technology and new pieces of equipment, you know, uh, uh, my mindset is probably to keep it simple, yeah. and, and keep repeating the simple stuff, and make it really great, turn it into a super part. Yeah, and have everybody enjoy it, and maybe can do it. You can answer my next question, which was going to be, uh, what should players be working on now if they're coming into the pre-season? That I think specifically, specifically we didn't go on there, but I, I think you don't have to because it's yeah. you know do the important things, do the things yeah. that you want to prioritise and do yeah. consistently. Yeah, well, I guess what what the the, the context of that question though is, if we're just starting out at, at the start of the season then we don't have that base of work under our belts. Yeah. So when I'm talking about working on acceleration, agility and sprinting, let's do that in small amounts to begin with mm-hmm. and let's build that up. So what we're doing is we're building up our tolerance, yeah. you know, we're adding a protective layer to it. So you know, we're, we'll do that through building the number of sets and reps that we'll do. We'll do short to long in terms of distance. So start with our acceleration in shorter distances mm-hmm. and then build that distance up. You know, typical sprint distances in team sports isn't actually that far. Yeah. Uh, it's the ability to get there, it's the ability to hold that speed, it's the ability to repeat that speed, um, it's the ability to do it in the context of the game. So when we're thinking about that, you know, typically we're working with uh, in acceleration terms, 5 to 15, 20 metres, and then in sprinting terms, kind of 25, 30, 40 metres sprint kind of work uh, or, or efforts. And we'll take some time to get to that. And that would be a week one of the yeah. season and, and we'll, we'll get there in a safe and appropriate way. And I think that's important for anybody that just is getting stuck in today or next week uh, out on the training pitch, you know, uh, consider what you've done. The more you've done, the more ready you are to do some yeah. more. If you haven't been doing too much sprinting or agility work, let's not do too much of it too soon. Yeah, yeah. I think that's important. Could be a few hamstrings going week one. Yeah. That's on you, not on me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so recently you kind of started this, I suppose what you call it, like a coaching business or you've got a lot more in the side of doing seminars and workshops. Um, where does that come from or what's the story behind that? Yeah, look I, I've spent a lot of time learning myself and that, that's mostly through mistakes and it's just time for me to kind of be really outward in how I share that. Yeah, and yeah I guess I'm kind of pursuing um, a coach education consultancy type type thing on, on, on a personal level um, and that's that's just really open I'm, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going yeah. with that but uh, here's here's my motivation and um, my motivation is to help other people uh, to help the other coaches or athletes that are really interested about being deliberate mm-hmm. in the development of speed agility power strength or coaching uh, or working on a collaborative team and those are areas that I just think are under educated right now, There's, the, yeah. the resources out there are, are just a little light, and um, so I'm just I'm just opening myself up to, to that to that kind of work. I just want to I want to um, I want to share some some thoughts, some ideas to help other people consider those and, and take them on and make them better than, than I can make them. And um, yeah, so that, that's really what I'm, I'm trying to do. Yeah, like I know um, in the lecture, like even on the practical side, we only really had. We only maybe had the guts an hour or two hours to go over the stuff, but um, I had taken some of the stuff into the rugby team I'm working with and all really enjoyed it, but it was very, very simple, not something you didn't even think about before. Um, 
and you, you're doing those seminars, you have a workshop, sorry, in February. Yeah. February, and it's in Black Box, in Black Box in Belfast, yeah. yeah. Um, 22nd, I think it is. 22nd of February. Like, I think, if you're, if you're listening to this and you want to maybe know even more about the specifics or learn how to do them drills really well, this is a good opportunity to do it at the workshops, because it's very easy to watch these things, but actually doing them and integrating them and coaching them is a different thing yeah. altogether. Like. Yeah, but well, like the, 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 this workshop and, <coughs> and all that one took is just open to anybody who wants to learn yeah. in this space or, or practice a little bit more and just refine their skills. Um, we, we've talked about it a little bit about how I, how I learned that through doing. Yeah. Uh, and really, it's just an opportunity to get really hands dirty in practicing these movements, coaching these movements, and exploring how we make athletic movement even more yeah. efficient than, than they are right now. So, um, you know, I'm really excited about doing those. It should, it should be a lot of fun and uh, enjoyable. We could, we could probably spend a week mm-hmm. in, some of the, in some of these areas, but what we'll do is we'll make it practically relevant. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll add context to different sports. And, uh, and hopefully give people a lot of takeaways that they can make instant impact with the groups that they're working with. Yeah. And um, if anybody wants to reach out to this with any questions or maybe find out more about the uh, workshop, where, where do we find it? Yeah. Um, you can find it <coughs> anywhere, you usually just hang around, hang around coffee shops, uh, most, most, mostly in Belfast, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get out and about. Yeah, just, just really, I've got a website uh, just to set up davidraycoach.com uh, I'm on social media, I think I do Twitter and Instagram, uh, and I'm on davidraycoach at gmail.com. Um, yeah, just, just contact me anytime uh, and talk to me about um, how I can potentially help uh, or if there's anything you've tried and learned from and can share back to me and I'm trying to learn as I go and uh, now I'm really, really open to that, so reach out and uh, um, I think that's us. Thanks very much. All right, no problem. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it.